Okay, so I'm Andrew Lunn. Who's oh. asleep? I'm Florian. <laughs> and I'm Vivian. And we're going to talk about distributed switch architecture, ACA DSA. So what is it? One slide. Who uses it? What were the design paradigms, et cetera, et cetera? We try to summarize it all in one slide, then you can fall asleep. And we're in a different world to everybody else who's been talking about things today. We're in the embedded market, the Wi-Fi access points, the set-top boxes. We're not top of rack. We're not talking about hundreds of ports doing 100 gigabit per second. We're probably talking about eight ports doing one gig if we're lucky. And we're talking about a little CPU, an ARM or a MIPS, some DRAM, Ethernet controllers, that sort of thing. And we have an Ethernet switch. Oh, we have multiple switches. Key point for DSA is the Ethernet control that's connected to the CPU, which is also connected to the switch. That's our main data path from the CPU to the switch. And we have a control path, either MDIO, I squared C, SPI. It can be memory mapped IO if it's integrated into the system and chip. And then the switch has got a number of Ethernet ports on it. They can have built-in FIs, they can have external FIs, and we have a few boards that have fiber connected to them. That is DSA in a slide. But then there's the D bit in DSA, distributed, which means we can have lots of switches. And then it gets really confusing. In this case, again, CPU, Ethernet controller, MDIO, a switch, which is connected to another switch, which could be connected to another switch. And then we've got to forward the packets around and round, and hopefully they don't go round and round, they actually come out at some point. And we've got these DSA ports, which we connect switches together with. Most of this is manual terminology, but in effect, it's generic, it should work with any chipset that supports this sort of concept. Now the application space. Who's using this sort of things? On the left, that's a rather old Marvel Wi-Fi device. Images taken from OpenWRT where somebody spent some time and actually labeled all the chips. And if you look, there's a Marvel switch and there's a Marvel processor there. And then the other side is a Broadcom board. <laughs> which I believe is a set-top box. It's got a, an Ethernet switch in the top left-hand corner connected to a quad phi, and the big hairy thing in the middle, I assume, is the processor. And the other domain we see lots of use of this sort of thing is in industrial transport equipment. Trains, planes, automobiles. You see, if you look underneath the seat on the next flight home, you might see the top box. You look at the um, passage in information systems on a train, it's probably got something like that in it. What switches do we support? As in, this was all started by Marvel, so as you'd expect, Marvel switches. And then Broadcom got involved with their rubber switch and the Starfighter 2. Qualcomm recently joined. So Qualcomm Athros Ethernet chips you find in Wi-Fi access points. MediaTek posted a few times in the last few weeks. Should hopefully get merged soon. Microchip posted two days ago. And there's yet another microchip coming soon. DSA has been around for a while. It's old, older than most of the rest of the network uh, switch stuff was first added in 2008 and then went dormant. Nobody's really interested in it. So you see between 2008, 2014, those just little peaks are API changes where somebody's done the mechanical work just to keep it compiling, but it wasn't really used that much in kernel. And then we got involved. And it goes, wee. <laughs> There's a lot more interest in it. So, bit of history, 2008, got added. Then it slept for a long time. 2014, the Broadcom Starfighter 2 came, 
and we started added things that go around the switch. <laughs> things like the EEPROM used to configure the switch sometimes. Some of these have got temperature sensors in them. They support energy efficient ethernet, work on LAN. The FIs we like to control in the Linux way, so we use the FILIB. And there was another Marvel chip came along. We're in the embedded space, meaning ARM, PowerPC, that means device tree normally. So we had to add a device tree binding. Then we actually got around to actually using the switch as a switch, hardware bridging, which was a novel concept. And then VLANs, then we fixed all the kernel splats when we unloaded and loaded the modules. Being able to reset the thing, net console, just generally making it more feature rich. And then we discovered that we'd done the device tree binding wrong because of various architectural problems. And the switches weren't actually Linux devices. So we changed all that and made them Linux devices. And then that allowed, up the, allowed us to use SPI based switches or memory map tile switches. And that opened up the path to get the Broadcom switch in, which is generally SPI or memory map tile. And Qualcomm came along and gave us their switch and yet another Marvel switch. 2017, more Marvel, more Starfighters. And then some interesting things started actually happening, like the TC offloads. We're starting to catch up on the top of rack boards. We're still a long way behind, but we're starting. And this is where we swap. Thanks, Andrew. So even though DSA has been around for some time, there were alternative approaches done before. Um, the most famous one is probably something called SWconfig that it has been designed by OpenWRT, now LEAD. Uh, it's a generic Netlink-based interface to program and query the switch. Uh, doesn't make use of proprietary switch tags, which we'll describe a little more in detail right after that. Uh, it instead uses normal 802.1Q VLANs to, to segregate the traffic. So a typical use case of a five port switch is one port is WAN, five, uh, one port is WAN, your internet access, four ports are your local uh, network. There is no per port network interfaces, so they don't appear to the user. The only thing you see is like your CPU, Ethernet controller, ETH0, whatever the name could, it could be. And each switch device was basically allowed to extend the Netlink API to provide any customization that the switch supports. So highly inconsistent from a user experience. Uh, the, this was proposed in October 2014, and this is, was kind of rejected for obvious reasons, but at least it started the discussion that eventually led to switch dev. Other approaches you may have found before from different vendors are based on slash proc, slash sys, debugfs, ioctl. Uh, people are very creative in how you could configure switches. Uh, creativity also means inconsistency, which is not great. There's still a lot of vendor proprietary SDKs in user space nowadays for better or worse, or even sometime, why not have the bootloader configure the switch and never touch it again, right? So during various conferences and side discussions, either on mailing lists or privately or through, well, people basically sort of agreed that the most sensible thing to do is that each switch port should be a network device because it's a great paradigm to work on. That way, standard Linux tools like IP, ifconfig will still work because these are network devices, so we can operate the network device layer and do whatever is necessary to make that work. Same thing for bridges. Um, you could extend that to team, bonding, etc. And the switch is basically a accelerator of what Linux can already do in software. So anything that can be offloaded is something that is a good candidate for the switch driver to take care of. And it turned out that DSA has been doing this since 2008, except the bridging part. So what does the data plane look like? So each port port network interface in DSA is called a slave interface. Uh, there's a bunch of tagging protocols for each vendor. So Marvel has two, Broadcom has two as well. Qualcomm has their own. There's also a generic trailer that could be like at the far end of your Ethernet frame. Uh, when you transmit, you call the slave network interface NDO start XMIT function, which 
is stubbed by DSA, so we can insert a custom header in there that will tell the switch hardware, hey, this port wants to transmit, well, sorry, this virtual network interface wants to transmit to this physical port. Um, vice versa, when you want to receive a frame, what happens is your CPU gets a switch tagged frame, it will call NetI NetIF receive SKB, and in there, there's a small hook where we can actually see, okay, this is a DSA-enabled master network device. We can uh, locate the DSA structure associated with and then extract the, from the tag, we can extract the information about which port we should deliver this frame to, and then this just looks like normal Ethernet frame delivery. So if we look at an Ethernet frame that would be, say, normal, you'd have the Ethernet header with destination header, source address, ether type, payload, frame control checksum. Um, then when the switch pushes a frame to the CPU, which in the switch terminology would be egressing, because packets make it out of the switch port, you'll find a switch tag that is typically inserted between the MAC source address and the ether type. There's all kinds of variants. Not all switching protocols are consistent in, in how they put something, but basically in there, between four and eight bytes, you'll find enough information to know that why is this frame sent to me in the first place, additional metadata, which can be timestamping information, uh, classification information, and more importantly, the source port of this frame, which is really how the magic works in that case. Conversely, when the CPU wants to send a frame towards a specific port of the switch, software or hardware can insert the switch tag at the same location, pretty much, and this will include additional metadata that might be useful to the switch and a vector of destination ports. So in terms of packet processing flow, what will typically happen is your network driver receive path will be invoked. Uh, we're, we'll set SKB arrow dev to say ETH zero. We'll then call NetIF receive SKB and then in the Ethernet layer of Linux, there's a small hook that says, oh, is this a master network interface? Yes, okay, in that case, am I using tags? Okay, yes I am. So I'm going to call the tag receive function, which will be responsible for identifying the tag format and will be either accepting the frame for delivery or rejecting it completely. And the acceptance of the frame delivery basically consists in popping the tag from the Ethernet frame, looking at the specific protocol uh, bytes and bits to determine the source port, and reassign SKB dev to the virtual purport network interface, and then we loop it back through for NetIF receive SKB, and then we hit the normal packet processing flow. So there's a small hook that does kind of all the magic, but it's reasonably simple. And Vijay. Sorry. So um, how do we control all that? So um, one thing that can be confusing is uh, switch dev versus DSA. So I will try to clarify that. <coughs> so what is uh, switch dev? Um, Jerry can kick me if I'm wrong, but I guess a switch dev is a st stateless API um, to implement a bridge and switches um, operations. So uh, it provides every operation that uh, a net device can implement, let's say, to add a VLAN, to add a, a MAC address uh, behind, behind a given port. Um, SwitchDev also provides um, uh, abstract models for, the, for all those things, so VLAN, FDB, MDB ent uh, entries. Um, these are so switch dev object. And typically what you will see is that uh, you will register by yourself um, a net device and you will provide this net device a bunch of switch dev ops. Um, so what switch dev doesn't do, um, switch dev doesn't register a net device for you. You have to, to do it yourself. So there is no driver model for the, the, the switches and switch ports. Um, so, 
what GSA does uh, with SwitchDev. So basically, uh, long story short, GSA uses uh, SwitchDev. What it does is trying to provide a stateful. Well, that's not really stateful because there is some stuff cached in, in the hardware, but um, <coughs> we will have a state for the switch port, the switch chip itself, and what we call the switch tree, which is uh, the whole switch fabric, so the, the logical switch. And so DSA provides as well um, a lot of bundle specific uh, tag. So we call that GSA because for historical reason, but uh, we don't only support, as Florian said, uh, Marvel tagging protocol. We also support Broadcom, Qualcomm, um, MediaTek, etc. So um, GSA provides that abstraction model for a switch chip, which is part of a switch fabric, and an abstraction for the, the fabric itself, which is the, the tree and the ports. Um, what does it do? The DSA framework will uh, register the net device, one net device peer port, and bind all together the net dev ops, the ETH tool ops, and the switch dev ops. Everything that glues together to make uh, every operation related to, to bridge and switch operations, like adding VLAN. Um, so yes, as I said, it implements the switch dev ops. And so um, we can we speak about next about the cross chip configuration that can be um, tricky. So a GSA driver will implement and add support for an Ethernet switch chip, uh, so the, the the chip itself. But that chip can be interconnected with others uh, to provide a hardware uh, switch fabric. So we can have, for instance, this setup with three uh, Ethernet switch chips and wired together through the DSA links, which provide to the user a hand uh, logical switch fabric of uh, nine ports. And there is some tricks with this. So the, the, the basic configuration that we have now um, given the fact that DSA drivers program their own individual, individual chips, is that um, we have the DSA links that are co correctly configured to pass packets through, um, uh, to any destination ports. And, but we still have problem for that. So some of the problem can be this, if we want to make like a bridge and want to bridge some, some ports together. Not all the ports, but some of them, like two on the left and uh, one on the right. So what, uh, what happened to the, the one on the, uh, in the middle? Or the other ports that are not bridged, uh, bridged uh, yet? So the thing is that we can potentially leak frames uh, with, the, with that configuration uh, because the actual configuration is too permissive. Um, and another problem can be for the, for the VLAN. So in that setup, if I want to provide um, a bridge, let's say 42, a uh, VLAN, sorry, 42 on the, on the bridge, so on the three bridge ports, what will happen, what happens today with the mainline kernel is that uh, switch one won't let the traffic pass. So you, you cannot have target frames with the VID 32 going through uh, switch one to switch two, and that's something that uh, that is going to be fixed. So, what can we do about that? So, for the cross chip uh, bridging, so this is not actually a problem because it works, but there can be a security problem because, uh, as I've said, uh, you can potentially leak frames. So, most of the Marvel switch uh, chips has what we call a PVT, which is a table basically. Uh, used to restrict uh, which uh, external source port um, is allowed to, to, to send packets to which local port. And so what we have done is that now uh, the DSA layer, so not the, the DSA driver itself, but the DSA uh, framework, when you add a, a port to a bridge, 
we will broadcast this information to all switch of the fabric. So every switch of that fabric will get the information like uh, switch zero, port zero, got bridge into BR zero. So with that information, every uh, dri uh, the Marvel driver can now program the switch to say, okay, I'm allowing only the port member of that bridge to accept uh, packets. So uh, this is uh, uh, done, uh, something like two days ago. And uh, for the cross-chip VLAN, that's my next step. So I'm going to do the same thing, like broadcasting uh, switch dev object. So whenever some somebody uh, add the VLAN 42 to the bridge, um, every chip of the fabric should receive that information and program the switch uh, accordingly. So that means that um, even switch one will see that uh, some part of the bridge, um, of a bridge as the VLAN 42, so it should program itself with the VID 42 to let uh, traffic pass through the DSA link. So that's the, the main thing, and the same uh, thing happens with the FDB and MDB, MAC addresses, uh, entry, and stuff, if you want to program static uh, addresses for management uh, port or whatever. But that will be easy thanks to the switch dev abstraction model for the, for the object. To the future. Andrew? That's me. Back to Andrew. Another contact switch. At the moment, we just support one connection between the CPU and the switch. If you actually look at a few Wi-Fi boxes out there, you often see there's actually two. And the vendor sets it up, so one is statically mapped straight through onto the internet port or the WAN port. We think we can do a lot better than that and actually do some load balancing. But we've kept saying we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this, and it's now actually getting somewhere near the top of Florian's to-do list. So. Maybe next year we can say, we did it. <laughs> We're also making use of the power of the Linux bridge. It knows how to do IGMP snooping. <laughs> we just need to wire it up. Again, it's just getting around to doing it. We're improving the distributed switch support. It needs more work. We see that there's a few devices out there that actually have fiber with fiber to the home. We need to improve that support at the moment so you can actually connect a fiber in, you can get the status from the fiber, the management information, etc. We've got a few new chips coming along with drivers, so we need to get the MediaTek driver merged and the microchip drivers merged. And then if you look a bit farther forward, team bonding, we can reuse a lot of the hard work that the Melanex guys have been doing of putting all the infrastructure in. We just need to work on the bottom layer. Try to use the TCAM in these chips to offload some of the firewalls. If you look at your wireless LAN access point, it's probably got a firewall in there. It would be nice to offload some of that to the hardware. The Qualcomm hardware can do hardware NAT. Again, it's offloading what can Linux already do down into the hardware. It's been interesting to get more vendors buying. We're not doing too bad at the moment. We've got a few vendors using it. More would be better. And then there's more TC style things, broadcast storm suppression, quality of service, yet more offloads to be implemented. So basically, the infrastructure's there now. We just need to start filling it out with more features. Questions? We have questions for you guys. <laughs> who's, who's ever heard and uses DSA? Oh, okay, uses. <laughs> heard of it. Yeah. So another question that comes usually is, okay, I want to support next generation hardware. 
it's a switch. Should I write a switch dev driver? Should I write a DSA driver? And so the key thing is, do you actually have an independent Ethernet controller in your system? Sorry. Because if that's the case, yes, you probably want to do DSA. If your switch is like more top of the rack where the switch and the Ethernet controller are kind of melted in the same hardware and can do DMA directly to your processor, then just go ahead with switch dev. Feature set is pretty much the same. Still no more questions? Okay, thank you, Ben. <laughs>